Bob Hope was not only a great comedian, he also was a great hero. What he did for this country in times of crisis will always be remembered. I just want you boys to see what you're fighting for, that's all. I was on radio at NBC, and the producer said, they want you at March Field next year. I said, what's March Field? He said, that's an Air Force base in Riverside. I said, well, what do we do there? You know, there's no war or anything. He said, well, they want you down there. It's a great audience. There you are, Cloney. You're down on your knees with 12 suitcases on your back. What are you going to do now? Well, no sense wasting a position like this. Get out the dice. And the audience was so great. I said, wait a minute. How long has this been going on? At Christmas time, war started, then it became dramatic. We went five straight years all around the world just doing troops, doing troop shows. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Well, here I am in London, but here we are on the USS Boxes. Here I am in Alaska. Colorado Springs. Guam. Tokyo. Here we are in Inserlik, Turkey. Inserlik, that's a Turkish word meaning don't knock it, at least Vietnam. Uban. Kakli. Karat. Achukuchi. Utapad. Van Rang Dang Dang. Chung Ching Chung Kang Air Base. I'm very thrilled to be here on... Where are we? <laughs> I was a little kid during the Second World War and uh, had these really vivid memories of sitting by the radio and listening to Hope. Well, some night. Some night. Some park. Some park. Some moon. Some moon. Some bench. Some bench. Some grass. Some grass. Some dew. I don't. <laughs> The soldiers and the sailors that he was entertaining were a real part of the show. You heard these people who were starved for entertainment, starved for some feeling of normal life again. And you heard this tremendous outpouring of energy from them. Bob Hope, when, when he came to entertain the troops, it made us, and it probably made other troops feel the same way, made them uh, uh, forget for a little bit the killing and the dying that was taking place, even though it was for just a short time. What's the difference between you and an idiot? Well, for one thing, you don't have a mustache. <laughs> Such a thrill for me, all these men whistling and screaming. Yeah. Yeah, they've been in the jungle too long. Hey, a little girl. Comb your hair, fix your makeup. Soon he will open the door. He was not interested in, uh, in anything but pleasing those people. When you went out on the stage, the acceptance was beyond a, a great audience, you know, that was going to give you a standing ovation before you even opened your mouth. Say, Bob, am I standing in the right place? Don't worry, honey. If you're not, they'll move the base. I don't know what I'm doing here, Bob. I can't sing and I can't dance. Oh, just stand there. They'll do the singing and dancing. Don't worry. He kept the morale up. That was what his job was, to keep that morale up for everybody. I'll give you eight bars to make your fame and fortune. Otherwise, it's back to the swamp. Go. I met Mr. Holt, and he wanted me to try a few bars of White Christmas. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. He kind of stunned me with his reaction because he said, You know, Crosby's got kids everywhere. I don't know what you guys did to get here, but let that be a lesson to you. He brought a little bit of home 10,000 miles away, and especially at Christmas time. Is uh, Specialist Fourth Brian? H. O'Connell here. Where is he? Would you come up, please? I went over to Vietnam approximately in June or July of 65. My wife was about six months pregnant. Just before we got on the plane, his wife brought this over to us. And here's a picture of twins, his twins that he's never seen. I had no idea what they looked like. I just knew that uh, they were twin boys. And I just want you to take a peek at these little kids as the first time he's ever seen them. Those... 
My dad didn't like to talk about Vietnam much from his personal experiences. But one thing dad did talk about from the war was the receiving the picture on stage with Bob Hope. Congratulations. When Bob gave me the, the brag book, I was proud, really proud of him, you know, and I thought it was great. I appreciate it very much. You know, it's a great feeling. Big bang, I saw the whole gang. That's a geisha from Texas. <laughs> front row, I mean, the whole front section was always the guys that had, like, a plasma drip going in. And they would be in bed. You, you knew that, that, that this was serious business. And, and to hear them laugh. You remember me, Rosemary's baby? Oh, my faithful old nurse. Yeah. You know, this isn't such a bad part. What the hell is all that firing over? General, will you call off this stuff, this war, while we're on, please? He would walk into a hospital, and only he could do this. I mean, and he, he would lead the, the gang. It was five women and myself and Peter Leeds and Les Brown and we all, big troop. And he'd walk in there, and his opening remark was, don't get up, fellas. You were seeing kids that had their arms and legs removed. You were seeing guys that had the whole front of their bodies sewn up with great big staples this thick. I broke down and cried. I, I, and he took me aside and gave me a lecture. This isn't why we're here. They want lightness. They want a joke. They want you to pretend that nothing is wrong. Mini skirts are bigger than ever. Even some of the fellas are wearing them. <laughs> Don't laugh. If you'd have thought of it, you wouldn't be here. I think one of the most emotional shows I ever played was when I played for the 1st Marine Division in Pavuvu down in the South Pacific because uh, we were playing an island called Banica and this fellow flew over and said, could you possibly do an extra show for the 1st Marine Division? They've never had a show and they would really love to see you and they're going to invade Peleliu. And so we flew over the next morning and you knew when you walked out there that you're playing for 15,000 kids, that a lot of those guys you never see again. And as it worked out, 60% of those kids were knocked off in this invasion of Peleliu. At the end of the show, we would traditionally sing uh, Silent Night. It's a holiday season. You're away from home, a long way away from home. And they begin singing Silent Night, and the entire audience chimes in. And by the time you're singing the last refrain, most men, and we were men then, had tears rolling down their eyes. And all you could hear were people crying. They wanted a dry eye in the, in the play. It was beautiful, and it was happy, and it was very sad at the same time. There's this entire audience of mostly men just in tears, and of course, we were all in tears. And I will never forget that moment, every, every single show. Have a Merry Christmas, and God bless you. Bye. joyous and you know we laughed till we cried but there were these guys going to go maybe so a number of them were going to go die we're all laughing together that's a real service in a lot of ways that's probably the last performance any of those guys saw in that regard that speaks volumes about the man bob hope is one of a kind he's a saint and if he isn't he should be god bless bob hope
Frank, from America, to all our men in blue, our boys in khaki too, our tough Marines, our Coast Guard, our Army nurses crew, we thank you so much, and thanks to our brave allies, the gallant Russian bear, the British everywhere, the free French and the Chinese, and you Latins way down there. We thank you so much. Fellas, this doesn't rhyme, but one of these days soon we'll be seeing you. In the meantime, this is Bob Hope thanking you for those letters to Command Performance, Armed Forces Radio, Los Angeles, USA. Speaking for everybody on Command Performance and saying the best of the best in the USA. So long. She's on her way, men. From us to you, every week till it's over, over there.